Uh, good evening. Uh, this is a public hearing of the Westminster County Rent Guidelines Board to take testimony and evidence pertaining to the board setting guidelines, uh, guiding rates of rent adjustments for uh, TPA uh, units. The uh, lease is beginning. Uh, between October 1st, 2014 and September 30th, 2015. Um, we have, I think, six board members now. I'm Jane Morgan Stern. I hope the others uh, will come in, you know, as we uh, are speaking. But let me ask that the board members introduce themselves, starting with, on my right. Uh, Ken Finger, owner rep, good evening. Good evening, Eddie Mae Barnes, public rep. It's a ruling, public rep. Thank you for coming. Kennedy Grosh, Kennedy Rep. Carol Hill, owner rep. Thank you for coming. Um, also tonight, we have uh, with us April Ray Puertas, who is our new uh, counsel for the board. I'm sure you recall that Michael uh, Rosenblatt retired several months ago. Uh, while we, we miss him, we are very fortunate to have April, and we're exceptionally fortunate to have the new um, Uh, I want to thank each of each and every one of you for taking the time to show up. Some of you I even recognize as we've shown up yesterday in our morning and maybe showing up next week if I plan again. It's very important for the members of the board to hear what you have to say. It's one of the factors they use when evaluating what to do. And you have the opportunity to watch that process progress uh, in White Plains at very public, open discussions uh, throughout the month of June. I also want to thank the members of this board here because uh, we'll get a tiny side pen. It's not nearly enough for the work that they do. It's almost a volunteer effort that they do uh, to, to do this task every year. So I want to thank the owners' reps, the uh, public reps, the tenant reps, and uh, the show. And I want to thank Howard for doing this tonight. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, is there anyone who wants to speak who hasn't signed the sheet? Who has not signed the sheet? Um, well, I have not signed, but I thought that uh, my name was submitted. Oh, oh, oh. what's your name? Uh, you press that? Yes, you're, you're on the list. Thank you. Anybody who wants to speak who didn't call in or sign the sheet? Here, you can come. And while well, we're doing that, let me also recognize Howard Breton, our intrepid court reporter. I'm sure that those of you who have been in here before recognize him. We will try to limit the speakers to five minutes each, unless you are representing an organization uh, or a group. <coughs> Just 
the text of what I'm going to say. My name is Jamie Dressa. I live at 8 Pace Hill Road, Pleasant Hill, New York. Pace Beach Hills. Greetings to the Grand Island Board members. I speak to you as a small business owner who earns the majority of his annual income from the rental of a 22 family residential apartment building on Warburg Avenue that is under VA control, and a small three-unit building on Central Park Avenue that is not. Both buildings are in Yonkers, where my family settled after leaving Italy rather than living under fascism. My brother and sister lived in the Warburg Avenue apartments. For both of these properties, expenses were higher this year over last year, primarily because of this winter's higher fuel expenses, higher taxes and water bills, and maintenance costs associated with repairs and maintenance to handle storm conditions and subsequent damage. Our accounting details were submitted as required to the DHCO for incorporation into the current annual income and expenses data set. Overall, a review of this year's annual income and expense report provided to the Rent Guidelines Board indicates that the industry's expenses were increased over the last years, reflecting the harsh winter, taxes, water, etc. This is past year new problem service. For those buildings that derive income from rents paid by federal and state programs, such as my building, 2013 also saw federal government sequestration policies cause agencies that handle rent payments to receive less money than they required. This funding reduction affected agencies such as HUD and Westhead, causing them to notify landlords that they could not pay the rent increases this board allowed. In June, for instance, Westhead only paid 1.25% increase for a one year lease, while this board granted a 3% increase for one year. That email is on the back. Even after funds were restored to the agencies, the difference in the rent paid versus rent that was allowed was not retroactively paid and the building owners were forced to accept the loss. With the reduction in rent revenue, a building owner relies on rent increases approved for capital improvements. To stem that source of revenue, new guidelines were put into place by PHCR that has extended the time required to receive a rent increase for capital improvements and their requirements for more detailed, project-specific cost documentation that has increased the accounting and legal costs associated with providing such documentation as part of the submission. In addition, there is movement by the DSHCR to deny once approved capital improvements as normal maintenance. So in summary, the regulations and controls imposed on the rental real estate business increases each year Expenses increase each year, while income is reduced and becoming more regulated. The trend is having a very negative effect on the business and dissuades younger investors from pursuing property management because of the profitability, specifically the return on time and financial investment, is steadily decreasing. In addition, landlords will reduce or eliminate capital improvements and maintenance because return on investment is reduced. So let me conclude by saying that the two buildings I own have been in my family for almost 40 years. However, I'm reluctant to pass them on to my daughter because of the burdens associated with their operation. Thank you. Um, before you sit down, I want to see if any board members have any questions. Anybody? Okay. Uh, why, um, why was the difference uh, made? Why didn't West have? conform to the decision that was made last year? Ms. Barnes, I asked them the same question, and we were told it was because of the sequestration. And the monies were held, were held back, but then they did not come forward and pay the amount that the, the, the guideline allowed. So we're getting hammered every, everywhere you turn around. And we asked for a fair increase, and we may not even be granted it from the agencies that pay the programs. This is this is a, a, an untenable situation. Thank you. Uh, 
Do you have another copy? Uh, I, I gave you all the copies I had, and the gentleman has okay. the copy I read from. I could send you more copies if you like. Send it to you, Ken? Okay, I'll email it to Mr. Finger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a real estate and insurance broker as well as the co-chair of the Apartment Owners Advisory Council. I also manage several small ETPA rental <coughs> regulated buildings that my family owns. Last year I spoke to the board for a need for a low rent guideline. As the re regulations, economic climate, and real estate industry have not changed or adapted to our desperate need for a low rent guideline, I once again find myself in front of this board asking the board to entertain the implementation of sayings. Case in point, four units out of a 21 family building that my family and I own in Yonkers have rents well below market rate. Examples of same. Apartment 2A, a two bedroom, it rents for $310 per month. It's inclusive of cooking gas, heat and hot water. The market rent in that building is $1,600. That's $1,290 below market. Second case in point. Unit 1F, also a two bedroom in that complex, rents for $721.17. Again, the market right here is $1,600. Again, the building is inclusive of cooking gas, heat, and hot water. That's $878.83 below market. Also, another problem I find myself facing with low rents is the tenants are exercising <coughs> the option they have of succession, which is granted to them with DTPA, which further exacerbates this problem because there's no adequate check and balance for the landlords, as the low rents will never get anywhere near market. Succession also truly denies those needing affordable housing. My family and I deal with extensive losses created by these low rents, which have severe impact on our budgets. Also, in our case, you can't take the position that the market rents are subsidizing those below market. As in the case with many smaller buildings, there are not enough units to go around to hold water with that argument. Something has to give in order to close the gap and still maintain services for our tenants. But at the end of the day, the numbers are black and white, and the loss is a loss. If these buildings are a co-op or a condo, there will be assessment added to a monthly maintenance when an excessive bill comes in, i.e. heating this season. As you are aware, apartment owners of ETDA units cannot do that. So what is the solution? How can the pain, if you will, be shared of these low rents? I ask that a separate addendum be added to the legislation to properly address this issue. A low rent guideline is necessary to help smaller landlords like myself stay in business. In closing, I would like to state that when I first started out in our family business about 20 years ago, my mother told me that if I was to give one piece of advice to you, she would tell me that when you stand, make sure you deliver. If for some reason you can't, sit down, regroup, and come back to the problem another day. As in the end, your word is your bond. I, sh I make sure when I stand for the buildings, I deliver. Out of respect for my grandfather who started this business over 60 years ago. Out of respect for my father who built the buildings. And also out of respect for my tenants who have entrusted their housing needs in my care, and I take that very seriously. But the problems that low rate generate are far beyond my control, and as such, I am desperate, I'm in desperate need of a low rent guideline so as to help me maintain the levels of service needed at our buildings. Your help in this matter would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. Any questions or comments? Um, Ms. No, I said four of the, the building is rent stabilized, four have low rents. But you, uh, but you own the entire building? Yes, ma'am. But what I'm saying is there's 21 units in the building, they don't offset the low rents in the building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we have the next uh, speaker, let me just uh, you know that we uh, now have two more members. The second member, Jimmy Walt, is a new tenant member, and Joe Green, uh, public member. More handouts for the next speaker. I don't think there are enough handouts, but we'll get, uh, we'll get them later. Uh, okay, uh, Matthew Crystal. Good evening. 
Matthew Persanis, PGR, SAM, audience. Uh, my name is Matthew Persanis. I'm Labor Counsel for the Building and Realty Institute. I've been asked to provide you with just a brief synopsis of some of the labor costs that the buildings are, um, have incurred last year and will incur going forward. Currently, labor makes up somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of a building's operational costs. The BRI collective bargaining agreement with Local 32BJ, the largest union representing building service employees, covers roughly 85% of the rental units in Westchester County. So it's a large sample of what's covered. In accordance with that contract, there are set increases that are required of employers. And that contract is going to expire this October. And I want to start by just giving you a very brief, just the last two years' history of what the overall increases have been. Two years ago, on October 1 of 2012, there was a 2.4% increase to labor costs, total labor. Not just wages, but health care and pension. In October 1, 2013, there was a 2.8% increase to those costs. We have recently had the advantage of the Realty Advisory Board, which covers buildings in Manhattan, having done their collective bargaining agreement less than a month ago. We often look to that agreement to see what is the trend in the area and what will we be facing when the union comes to sit down at the table and ask for increases. It, gives us, it may not be an exact guide, but it gives us a good idea of what they think they're going to accomplish. And along with that, which covers New York City, we also get a good idea when we compare that with what nationwide trends tend to be. And it gives us a good idea of how to forecast what we're going to come up against in October when our contract expires. Uh, I will be negotiating the contract I have for the last 14 years. And what we can expect based on what New York City did is anywhere from a 3.2 to a 3.4% increase. Uh, we can expect that for this year, October 1, and we can probably expect that for each of the succeeding three years after that. You're probably wondering, how do we get to that amount? There's going to be anywhere between a 7 to a 9% increase in health. Uh, we're still a bit far out to narrow that number down. We probably won't be able to narrow that number down until the beginning of August. But it could be based on the trends and what we've seen, anywhere from 7 to 9%. Uh, if any of you are involved in paying for your own health care, you know the trend over the last decade really has been almost 10% per year. There's been a lot of changes that have been implemented to the, um, to the employee health plan to try and reduce costs. And that's why it's not going to be a 10%, but I think 7 to 9 is a realistic number. The pension plan, which is governed by the Pension Protection Act, the federal law, that's going to be an increase of anywhere between 5 and 10%. Again, a lot of that depends on how the stock market performs over the next four months when we get there, and what the projections of that stock market will be over the four years of the next contract. Uh, and like any fund, the pension fund is heavily invested in the market, and that's how it tries to keep uh, rates from increasing. The last one is wages. Wages is where the people working kind of take the hit. When the pension costs rise and the health care rises, the money has to come from somewhere. And oftentimes, the only thing left is wages. We can expect, based on what we've seen, not only nationally, but also based on the RAB contract, Realty Advisory Board, anywhere from a 2.5% to 3% increase in wages. Uh, again, what that becomes is somewhere between 3.2% and I think 3.3% of the total increase to labor costs. Nationally, we're looking at 2.8% in 2013, and right now in the, almost the first half, almost the full first half of 2014, we're looking at 3.2% nationally. That number tends to be a little lower than the New York City area, which includes West Virginia. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanders, the number you gave us, uh, excuse me, what's that? 2.4% in 2012. 2.8% 2013. Is that just wages or is that included? No, that's an overall increase. That's the overall. Yeah. Now, approximately, what is the cost 
per employee per month for the health benefit? Right now, the current health plan costs twelve eighty seven per month, one thousand two hundred eighty seven dollars per month. There's under the plan, uh, which is governed by ERISA, it's a jointly administered health plan between the union and the management side. There is no provision for employee contributions towards that plan, nor do we expect the plan to be altered. So for every employee who uh, belongs to 32 BJ, he gets uh, approximately, what's that about? Uh, it costs the employee about $15,000 a year? Yes. And that's on top of his wages. Right, it's about fifteen and a half thousand dollars per year on top of wages. That's all along with a pension contribution of about four thousand dollars per year. There's two smaller funds. I didn't bring up because they're very small, um, but there's a legal and a training fund that's a required, and a four hundred one k. The four hundred one k is ten dollars per week, so you can get that out. It's five hundred twenty dollars per year. Uh, the pension, sorry, the training fund is approximately two hundred dollars per year, and the legal fund is about two fifty. Mm -hmm. Overall package though was two point four in two thousand twelve, two point eight, and well, like I said, about three point two to three point three percent this year. Thank you. Expected. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I've been asking the same question. Are you going to ask me why I don't do a better job? Pardon me? Are you going to ask me why I don't do a better job? I'm, I'm <laughs> going to ask the question sure. again. Do you know what percentage of people who are members of the UJ against the United States that you negotiate? Do you know how many of them, uh, what percentage they represent or uh, of the ETTA units and what special taxes for whom we have been guided on. Yeah, do you mean the, the workers, how many of them? How many of the union are? What percentage of the workers who do the same, similar work? About 85%. About 85%. 85%? I think this is the first time you said that. But okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. 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 I was ready for you this time. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by a gentleman named Shelly May. Uh, and it's lucky to invite her to come up and uh, speak to you and come to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to come. Thank you. Uh, I'm Assemblywoman Shelly May from the 90th Assembly District here in Yonkers and Tulsa here. I will submit testimony by email, but I, I did want to. Uh, Express my concern tonight about any potential rent increase for tenants. Excuse me, I think if you step back, step back. a little bit, you may not have that echo. echo. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Medium. 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 Thanks. Okay. As recent reports from Controller Tom DiNapoli and the nonprofit group Community Housing Innovations have determined, we are facing a severe crisis in housing affordability across the state where many people have seen their real incomes decline over the past few years, and the majority of employment growth is in low-paying jobs. These problems are particularly acute in Westchester, where 53.3% of rental households are paying more than 30% of their income on housing, being the affordability threshold by the federal government. This reflects an increase of almost 14% since 2000, meaning far more families are simply struggling to stay afloat. Even more troubling, according to the controller's report, 28% of Westchester's renters pay above 50% of their income in rent, which he characterized as severe housing's loss burden. Unfortunately, many of our residents are driven from this region or are simply unable to invest in our local economies because they are spending such a large percentage of their income on housing and have no disposable income remaining. This is particularly true for Yonkers residents who earn significantly less than the Westchester or New York household median income. According to U.S. Census data, the average median income for Westchester is over 80000 but for Yonkers residents, it is just 56000 That is below the statewide median in one of the most expensive regions in the country. I urge you to consider the challenges my constituents experience in the face of eroding incomes and increased rental costs. 
And I am mindful and sensitive of the expenses faced by property owners, particularly small ones. But I note that the current economic recovery is simply too fragile and too slow to recover anything or justify anything other than the most modest increase. I do want to alert you that on the legislative front, we are working hard to change some of the laws that govern rental tenants. The Assembly League passed a bill I co-sponsor, which would limit MCI increase to a fixed duration for the cost of the project, rather than permanently, and would limit MCI increases to a maximum of 6% of the monthly rent. Unfortunately for us, ETTA counties outside of New York, MCI increases have been more than double that, and I believe it's unacceptable and must change. Another bill we are working on would prohibit the temporary retroactive rent increase or surcharge prior to the approval of the MCI application for rent stabilized apartments. Under current law for rent stabilized tenants, as you know, in addition to the cost of an MCI becoming part of the tenant's base rent, the landlord is entitled to collect a temporary retroactive surcharge which is the amount between the effective date and the collectible date of the DHCR order. This bill will eliminate this undue burden created by the combined effect of the permanence of the increase in the retroactive temporary surcharge by eliminating the temporary surcharge. Again, these are bills we are, get, we are pushing to get passed. So as we work in the legislature to strengthen tenant protection in Albany, I did want to come and I drove directly from Albany to be here to urge you to do what you can to ensure we maintain affordable housing stock that we have, as limited as it is, and consider the challenge these rental tenants and their families face when you make your decisions. This year, I urge that if you do have an increase, you consider the serious challenges my constituents, our renters and yonkers face, and that you keep it as modest as possible. Thank you, I'm happy to answer. Good evening. Thanks for having me on the uh, Okay, nice to hear you too. Uh, can I ask you the median income in Yonkers? What would that apply to every single family residence? That's how the, that's uh, um, census that census data from the American Community Survey from 2012, which I cited. I'll, I'll give you the. And what was that about? The median income, fifty-six thousand of the 2012. Fifty-six. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, for coming. I, I'd like to know what the legislature is doing to put more money uh, into the hands of tenants to assist them to pay their rent when you recognize that there is a problem of many paying more than the statutory acceptable 30%. Are you talking about an MCI? I'm talking about what the legislature oh. is doing to put money into the hands of tenants, period, so that they are not faced with the problem with paying such a, what you said, is a large portion of their income in rent. What is the legislature doing to correct what is the social problem? I appreciate the well, fact that you expect the landlords to deal with it. What is government doing to deal with it? Well, I know for myself I'm pushing very hard to enact legislation that would allow localities like Yonkers to enact a higher minimum wage, which would, I believe, contribute to many of these lower income uh, tenants having the ability to, to make enough money. So we are, I, I personally have an agenda to try to help tenants make more money. Well, how, how about something that would put the money directly into the hands of tenants? How about uh, more money into screen, more money into programs of that nature that will assist tenants directly. Uh, it's nice to say let's increase the minimum wage. You know and I know that isn't really, uh, it'll not take years before that seeps down uh, to the uh, to And the I respectfully disagree with you because the bill that is having traction in Albany is not to increase the minimum wage statewide but to allow localities to adopt a higher minimum wage. And that actually has some Possibly passing, but I'm in favor of additional funds for SCREE and other programs that provide money directly to tenants. So, what's happening to make that happen? Ted, this is, this is not intended to be a forum for. No, but I have a right to ask her questions, and I'm asking questions. May, she's may complaining. I say no, she's complaining about the fact 
that there uh, the 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 a percentage that tenants pay is great, and she put down for two statistics: 53% pay more than 30%, 28% pay more than 50%. I'd like to know what the and she's putting it on the landlord. What is the legislature doing? She's here as a legislative representative. I have the right to ask that, and this is a very intelligent well, person who I'm sure can answer. She did answer. Sorry. Is there something more you want to add? I would say I'm happy with you. What we did in the budget, and come back to you and answer you on the specifics of what we added. But I can tell you, the assembly has been a strong, strong uh, push to increase screen and to put money directly into these programs of these tenants. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I have a shared responsibility, shared responsibility for a market in Mount Vernon, both for realty. Um, my name is Barbara C N I E L, and I just want to say that being at these wonderful hearings to have people be able to express their concerns, whether it be via the, the landlord or via the tenant. You know, they sound very similar to me because both of them are trying to keep a balance. And that's why when we come to you, what we're really saying is there is problems within the financial for the tenant, but there's also problems for the landlord. So um, actually, we almost are singing to, together a song that causes us to try to figure out how can we be fair, fair to the tenant, fair to the landlord. So your considerations are very valuable, and I want to thank you for taking your time and effort to look at how you can resolve giving the landlord some type of way that they can maintain their buildings in the way that they really have pride to have the people that live there consider their home is their place. That takes money. It also takes from the government or from wherever people's efforts to maintain their own lives. So it is a big challenge for you all, and again, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Just what's the size of the building? How many units? Uh, this is an eight family. Uh, eight family. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Neal was our last speaker, at least uh, on the list. If there's anybody else who wants to speak, uh, this is your opportunity. Move to adjourn? No, we no. have another speaker. Oh, so she's she was the last, except oh, okay. that I invited another speaker. After you finish speaking, we'll ask you to sign uh, our list. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Miller. I was supposed to tell our address. No, that's okay. Okay. Uh, what I'm here to say is no more increase. And the reason I'm bringing this to the attention is because of the fact there are so many people that are out of work. There are people that are families, rather, that are doubling up. I know in my own household, I had to help someone else because they're in this situation. One of the things, um, my other hat is with Congressman Elliot Ingalls' office. And as a caseworker, this year I have seen an increase of either evictions, people not finding apartments, and they always think we can help with housing. Unfortunately, we cannot. And right now, with rent increases, and families having such a hard time just making it. It really, if anything, rents need to really come down. 
it has been so difficult for a lot of families. And so I, I come before you hoping there will be no more increases at this time. We know, you know, again, things may change, but right now, this is where we are. Thank you. Thank you. 